day one of the August 99 10-day retreat in spring water. The rustling of cushions and bodies has calmed down. the gentlest of breezes stirring in the leaves, hum of in insects, the breathing, is it there? Are we here? Which means, is the breathing here, and the humming, and the stirring, the breathing? The sunshine, sparkling on the leaves and grasses. Bird calling. Are we here? Heart is beating. The body either tense or relaxed. Quivering leaves. Cool air. And bright light. And thoughts coming and going. Are we here for a moment, this moment? of no special time. The first day of retreat we talk about listening, a new kind of listening. which may come as a surprise when the body-mind is open. Not listening through thinking. It always surprises me when people say, some people, I have to think first before I can listen. Before I can hear or see something, I have to think first. This is how it feels to the mind and body that are so at home, in quotation marks, so at home in the thought world, in the picture and memory and knowledge world. And so, unfamiliar with the immediacy of rustling leaves and birds calling and breathing and heart beating, unbeknownst, unnamed, unjudged. Someone who leads a meditation group asked me this morning, a 
is it possible to have unguided meditation? Not drawing attention to this or that in the body, on the outside, verbally, and in this way becoming a leader of a sort, of the group. And feeling how people who come to a sitting want that because it seems easier to pay attention when somebody draws attention. We're doing it here in a way, every once in a while. The humming of insects. Quivering leaves and branches. And then the question, is it possible for this human being to wake up, be awake for moments at a time on our own? Not guided or talked to or exhorted, required, reminded, pushed, pulled. It's up to us to find out if this is possible. There are very few hours in a year where there's a talk. Most of the hours of the year are without that. And yet, it does happen to us, amazingly enough, that we do wake up for moments, become aware of what's going on inside and out, maybe just for a split second. And then the discursive, judgmental intellect sits in criticizing or wanting something different, discontented with what is and describing it inwardly through thought and wishing things were, were different with oneself or one's environment and sort of avalanching over this moment of coming to which happens to human beings. A moment of just caw-caw and breathing and rustling and winding and cooling and heating. We want to sort of force or expedite or train this moment of waking up, of coming to, of being attentive. And yet it does happen on its own if we give it a chance to manifest without immediately pouring over it. pouring over it, the covering, the dressing, the frosting of thinking about ourselves and the world, which is such a strong habit for all of us. And living in that thought about ourselves and the world, oblivious to this gentle murmur inside and out, which is the murmur of life, unadorned, unnamed. So what is true listening? which we talk and write and hear about so much.
not just listening with the ears, the acoustics of it, the physiology of it. That's there, that's operating, and we don't even know how it does it. No one is really controlling it. The miracle of life, listening, hearing, seeing, touching, tasting, thinking will include that. Very wise of the Buddhists to throw the thinking in with the sensing. A very similar manifestation being alive as a human being. So, not just listening with the ears and looking with the eyes. It's beautiful Zen saying, listening with the eyes and looking with the ears. And that doesn't exclude the other senses because it is one whole perception which is one whole humming and breathing and winding and aching or joying. One whole indivisible movement of aliveness. Not separate. Even though the intellect makes it so, makes it seem like there's the hearing and there's the looking. <clears throat> and how can I train the hearing better or, or see better? Which is all possible. We can train the senses enormously. Or else put glasses on or hearing aids. But this openness of perception is more than the sum of all the senses. It is pure presence. Without the divisiveness of wanting it to be different. So what's in the way of this, this open listening? And when we use the word listening, now we include all the other senses. Words are clumsy to describe what is so simple. What's in the way of this simple looking, seeing, listening, awareing? And that's for us to find out time and time again. Somebody wrote me a letter a little while ago describing very accurately what she observed about herself. All the different movements of eating, wanting, the feeling from eating and so forth feeling from overeating. And then stating there must be something more than this watching everything. Is that all there is? I, I don't remember it verbatim. It'll be in the next newsletter. <laughs> And the first response in reading this is, yes, listening and looking is endless. It's as long as this life lasts. Watching what comes up when there is reactiveness, when there is no reactiveness, no thoughts coming up, or desires or fears, then there's nothing to watch. There's just what's there without an attitude without an opinion about it or a judgment over it. But we don't usually live in this space, or if we do, it comes and goes for most of us. 
And what is at work then? On seemingly autopilot is reactiveness and fear and wanting and conflicting, hassling, angering, depressing, despairing, or pleasuring. And unless it's seen, heard, touched, and tasted directly, immediately, it goes on very automatically and creates its own mischief. Whether there is something more than just watching or listening, let's come upon that, let's find out directly. Because just talking about it creates an image and then the wanting that state while ignoring the state that's here upon us right now of wanting, of discontent with what is, and allowing that to surface into full light of listening, realizing it, making it real, making it real in the light of perception. And with that, the possibility of letting it go. A reactiveness perceived, seen through clearly, loses its grip on this human being in an amazing way that allows the body to relax again and move on with an undistorted energy which is distorted by the thoughts we have about ourselves and each other, distorts the energy. Recently, reading dialogue between Krishnamurti and Bohm in one chapter, they both agree on calling it brain damage, creating imagery and living in that stuff. It's an interesting way of putting it. It's very shocking, because we think, there's a certain category of people who are brain damaged. But a damaged brain is a distorted brain, distorted by ideas about how things ought to be or should be or have been, gripped by that and unable in that grip to see and hear what's actually going on. Painful or joyful? What are these damages that are in the way? The expectation, we can, we can let go of the word if it's too shocking. Don't need words to describe, we need to find out directly. Expecting things to happen, it sets the whole body-mind in a, in a, it orients it towards something, anticipating. We anticipate a delicious meal, the mouth starts salivating. There's nothing on the table yet, but the thought gets the body to anticipate and to respond with these reactions, reflexes. And in that anticipation, moving away from maybe a hunger feeling. What is hunger? if it is explored rather than sliding into anticipation of food. That's for all of us to experiment with, particularly easy in a retreat. Easier than in our daily life where there isn't the silence and space to become aware of what happens. That one is now living in anticipation of food and not with what 
generates this anticipation? What generates it? To ask that question and then be quiet and listen inwardly. And maybe, not the first time, maybe not the second time, who knows when, maybe immediately, coming upon sort of a restless discontent inside. And not moving away from that once it is sort of sensed vaguely. Not wanting to stay with it. Preferring the habitual internal videos with their stimulation. Stimulating the whole body. Away from maybe boredom. I'm not saying it has to be a restlessness, has to be discontent, it's for us to find out. By waking up to the fact that we're involved in fantasy of something that's not happening right now. We started with the hunger feeling and wondering what that is. It's sort of an open question, not a threatening question. Reveal yourself or else. Wondering is, is not violent, it is gentle. Opening, trying to find out. So what else is in the way of of open listening, expectation, anticipation, with its inevitable sooner or later disappointment because the world does not unfold the way we expect it to or want it to. It does not. Maybe here and there for brief moments. But living so strongly holding on, so strongly to what should happen and what we expect to happen. There's disappointment when there's glimpses of how things really are. And as disappointment manifests and we feel it directly, immediately, can it shift into looking what really is going on and letting go of the expectation that letting go of the expectation happens on its own when there is a shift to what is really happening. Not the disappointed expectation, but what? Sort of sensing, sensitively, inwardly, with new ears and eyes, that don't know yet what is there. It's not known yet, even though it's there. Knowing it comes later. Quite generally, we can say that being filled up with ourselves, our own importance or unimportance, all that goes with that prevents open listening. So, to wonder, what am I occupied with? What are all these thoughts? about listening in, as it were. What am I thinking about? And wondering whether it has to be this way. Not that it shouldn't be, but is it inevitable, ordained for all of our life, that we're 
filled from moment to moment with ourselves, our needs, our fate, our difficult childhood, our difficult present life, our difficult future, uncertain future. which automatically blocks out this amazing living now with some space, giving some space to what's here, space from this self-involvement which human beings like you and me are so dunked in, so permeated with. so unaware of a good deal of the time. And to bring that, to allow that to come awareness without instantly lowering the boom of criticism or judgment about selfish me. It's just more self-concern. Letting these moment-to-moment -moment movements of conditioning come to light in the form that they usually take thoughts and emotions that are connected with the thoughts, imagery, remembrances, of all the feelings that remembrances can instantly evoke in this body. to let it be seen and heard and felt. We think that's not enough. There must be something more, something more spiritual, exalted. Somebody wrote me that too. Recently, I haven't answered that letter yet, but one of these days I will. That there are these two different schools of spiritual teaching, one it says, look at your conditioning, be aware of your moment-to-moment moment -moment reactions and emotions and involvement. And the other one pretty much ignoring this and says, be with a whole. With non-separateness, with whatever all words are used that do inspire us in hours of despair. generate some energy. So what's the right way? Well, neither is the right way. There's no right way or wrong way. There's waking up to what's going on and letting what grips this body, mind, emotions, feelings, tensions, or pleasures, let it be illuminated without immediately having a plan of action about it. This awareness that does not judge or want or fear, but irradiates what's going on. And maybe what is going on isn't the same in this light of looking and listening. So I'll say it today, right on the first day, usually it comes on day three, four, five, or whichever, when people are so desperate that there are still so many thoughts in the mind. By now the mind ought to be quiet. Well, that's another very heavy thought. To, to, to open up to all of this, these ongoings which happen on the surface. Maybe there's a moment where you have insight that this is all surface movement. It has a depth to it which is not touched by the surface. So not to hassle with it or try to get rid of it, bring it, get it away or clutch it when it's pleasant. 
let it be seen, heard, felt spaciously. Which is something that silent, sitting, walking being makes possible to let it be and see one's resistances and, and these inbuilt reactions to, to, to marvel at their power and yet not unbreakable power unbreakable power sounds as though we're out to break it it can dissolve. The power of reactiveness can resolve when there's a real awareness. Not just of this momentary grip of reactiveness. That's not enough. It has to have that space of wind and trees and birds and people and heartbeat and pain and pleasure all contained yet not attached to <coughs> so it's so clear isn't it it's not a theoretical argument to listen clearly we need to see what prevents the clear listening. Wonder about this, and if we wonder enough, and there is some energy in this wondering and curiosity, then things do reveal themselves through that energy of inquiry. What is in the way? Filled upness with myself. Not, it sounds judgmental, I'm not judging it. We know it all. It's so familiar. And we find all kinds of gross and subtle rationalizations, justifications for it. For being so involved and concerned with ourselves. It's well defended, well justified, well rationalized, by the brain and the body goes along with that. It starts to feel diseased when these defenses are questioned. When this whole process of meing, eyeing, is questioned. So let these let, let the disease that happens when these things are questioned, let that come into awareness too. how strongly we're attached to our patterns and how much we fear the upset of a pattern even though it gives us a lot of grief. We complain about it. We want to be free of it, but we have never noticed how we hold on to it. Don't want to let go. To come upon that so that this conflict becomes clear and maybe resolve itself. As long as I want it and grab it, how can I want to be rid of it? It's, it's absurd. But this has to clarify in our awareness. This conflict between grabbing it and at the same time Oh, no, at another time. It's not the same time. Another time saying, I don't want this. I want to be free of it. Can you help me free myself of my patterns? Give me a method. There is no method that can beat inside that happens on its own when we are really becoming interested. The word interest sounds too shallow. Well, maybe a better one will come. Deeply, deeply concerned. A 
but our moment-to-moment -moment ways in which we affect each other so profoundly. As an airplane is humming in the breeze of breathing and listening. Just a few words <coughs> about this old topic of authority. Maybe we can renew it. The tendency of all of us to create authority in someone else, meaning by that, wanting that person to tell me what to do. Believing unquestioningly what this person says taking it over verbally, in memory. What is said here in these talks and in meetings is not offered as any kind of dogma teaching to be followed, to be remembered. Actually, the more open the listening is, the less one remembers then this memory track is at ease. It's not operating so strongly. If we're really listening and looking right now, people often say this, you know, I really love the talk, but if you asked me what it was about, I couldn't tell you. I said, well, same here. <laughs> And we're not putting down memory. There are lots of things we have to remember. Write down. It's a very, very useful, indispensable tool. Memory. But in these talks, we don't need to have this obsession to remember what is being said. Every once in a while, somebody has a pad and paper in a talk and starts scribbling. And how can you ever keep up with what is being said, and how can you hear what's saying, what is said now when you write what was said a moment ago? That's why we sell tapes, not just to support the center. But if you want to hear it again and live it again, look again, you can replay it. Right now, let's just listen and look together and wonder about it if it's not clear. Letting it sit there and ununderstood. Don't have to understand everything. Things either become clear or they're not clear. When they're not clear, it doesn't mean that one has to battle it or resist it or adopt it verbally. It, it has its own way of operating. Something that's not clear and yet one wants to understand it to leave it alone, but it doesn't leave us alone. It works in us and maybe in our perceptions. So, to become aware of our big yearning for authority, either having an authority to follow or becoming an authority. That's a whole topic of its own, this yearning, this urge to become an authority. There in all of us, because we have spent so many years of our life, of our young lives, being taught and regimented and instructed and corrected. Sometimes, if we were lucky, by someone who just doesn't do it to feed their own ego. That's when, when, when words start flourishing. And not just the words flourish, but they, they have roots to a greater depth. When we hear things that 
do not come out of somebody's urge to be somebody or become somebody. So, I didn't finish what I started. Because we have been so much taught and instructed, there is this seemingly natural urge to teach others now and instruct them. It gives us sort of a certain satisfaction. It's like the same as this tit-for-tat thing. You taught me, I'll teach you. Since we're talking about it, maybe to, to notice it when it happens. And to question each other. Are we free enough, open enough, undefended enough to question each other? When we feel we become teacherish, and by that I don't mean saying something out of the fullness of one's presence, but in order to feed something in myself that was hurt long ago. This sort of scar of humiliation or stupidity, dumbness that we all carry around. And now passing it on to others, trying to make up for this in the wrong way. And please, I know there are teachers here. I'm not down on teachers. Maybe it'll come up in a group that we look at this. And the motives, motives that propel us to do something can come to light. And that does not need to eliminate our whole activity. It can purify our teaching when we see the motives and realize that this, not, this is not all that moves this desire to learn from each other and for each other. Careful with that judgment. If that is not there, we can look easier at ourselves and each other. We will end here for today.